Good morning. Uh, well, we want to wish Happy Mother's Day to all the mothers. Um, we're sorry that we couldn't be together for this Mother's Day. I know this is a really special day for, for all the mothers, and, and we pray that God would just give you a, a wonderful day with your family. Um, we're planning, uh, hopefully, next week, unless you hear different from us, hopefully next week, next Sunday morning, um, what will the date be? Next Sunday morning at 10 o'clock, we're going to be here. I don't know what the date is, but it's the week after Mother's Day. We're going to be here on the 17th. Um, it sounds like the crown has eased a little bit on, on the restrictions um, concerning the scandemic. And hopefully we'll be able to uh, begin to just continually open up more and more. I understand if some of you still aren't sure you still don't want to come. I... I'm totally fine with that, but there are people that I know want to be here. So next Sunday morning, the 17th at 10 o'clock, we'll have worship. At 1030, we'll have service. And so uh, come here. But the only bad news on that will be the fact that uh, the videos won't be out till next, the following day, which would be the next, next Monday morning. So this, this video will be up on Facebook and YouTube the next day. But we want to have service here next Sunday morning. If you have any questions, call. We'll try to make sure we get the word around in case people don't see this video. And come early if you want to socialize. And my wife says come early if you want to socialize. But you have to stand at least six feet away. <clears throat> at least what we've heard from the hoax. <clears throat> You can tell I have a lot of respect for this whole thing. This morning I want to give you something that, that uh, God gave me. And I'm really excited because actually I'm going to be preaching the next two weeks. I know, I understand that tomorrow is Mother's Day. But I'm going to be preaching something that has to do with mothers actually. Maybe next week and then the following week. So, you know, we're always right on the ball here at Son of Water. But this morning's... Uh, Message is, is entitled, Without a Clue, Romans 11. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. I love that scripture. The judgments of God are how God thinks and how God decides. Isaiah prophesied uh, through the voice of God saying, my ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. Paul says here that God's ways are beyond our potential to ever follow. God is literally untraceable. He's unsearchable. Look what the psalmist wrote in Psalm chapter 77. Thy way is in the sea and thy path in the great waters, and thy footsteps are not known. I love that scripture. When Israel came to the Red Sea, who could have ever guessed that God's way led right through the middle of it? At some point in the eons of eternity past, God had already walked through and prepared the way for Israel to cross ahead of her enemies. God had already made a path. He had already walked through and they followed the steps of God and it was hidden by the sea. God's ways are a mystery. His thoughts are enigmatic. He must be sought outside of the conventional. The word conventional in Webster is based on or in accordance with what is generally done or believed. We like normal and we like familiar. Why? Because we're creatures of habit. We wouldn't think to look outside the box because we aren't even aware that there is an outside of the box. We like a God who's predictable. We like a God who does things the way that we expect them to be, done, to be done. Look at Psalm 77 and 14. I'm sorry. Yes. Thou art the God that does wonders. Amen. Thou art the God that does wonders. Thou hast declared thy strength among the people. 
The psalmist declares him to be the God of wonders. We sing that song, God of wonders beyond our galaxy. Do you know what the word wonders literally translates in the Hebrew? It literally translates God, the God of hidden things. Wonders. The word wonders is the word hidden things. Wonder has to do with surprise through the unexpected and the unfamiliar. So if we really want to find wisdom and understanding, we must begin to search in unfamiliar places. Why? Because we're searching for the hidden things of the God of hidden things. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, Paul says that wisdom was hidden for our glory. This is one of those paths that God has already walked on and made his footprints in. And then he covered it over with the sea. He covered it with the sea. Remember in scripture, the sea is always a type of the soul, the restless soul. The waves of the sea coming into the shore are always a type of, the, of our restless soul. So in order to find the paths of God, we must search beyond the soul and the soul's ability to understand. That's what the psalmist was saying. In order to find these, these hidden wonders, these hidden paths of God, we must search beyond the soul. Look at Colossians chapter 2 and verse 8. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of man after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. <clears throat> How many understand that when you see the word beware, you ought to pay attention? How many would walk into a field where there was a giant sign that said, beware of the bull? How many would walk into a yard where there was a sign that said, beware of the dog? How many would walk into a house that said, beware of the owner? That's kind of my kind of sign. Beware. Beware means perceive. It means discern. It means be aware. Pay attention. Jesus would always use the words take heed. Paul said that we need to keep our eyes open for men who would spoil the word is seduce us through philosophy. The word philosophy actually comes from two Greek words the word phileo and the word sophia. Phileo means a deep love for, and sophia is the word wisdom. Beware of men who would seduce you through the love of wisdom. The love of wisdom. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, Paul warns the church about natural wisdom, which has literally no spiritual value at all. How many understand that every place that there's something real, there's always something that's counterfeit? So there's real wisdom, which is Jesus come in the flesh. He is the wisdom of God. And then there's the wisdom of man, <clears throat> the wisdom of the natural. Natural wisdom is greatly desired in this world because it brings you the honor of men. Paul calls it vain deceit. Our soul has this desperate longing to be validated. And to be found worthy of attention. Please give me your attention. Please validate me by giving me your attention. We hate to be ignored. We hate to be disregarded or to be seen as insignificant. People hate that. It causes rejection. Natural wisdom, though, gives us a platform on which to display our value. It gives others the opportunity to honor me the way that my soul desires to be honored and the way that I desire my, or the way that I honor myself. Paul calls this empty deception. He says that natural wisdom follows the rudiments. He uses the word rudiments of this world. How many use the word rudiments a lot? Rudiments. How many have any idea what that means? <clears throat> Rudiments mean to walk in step with natural principles. 
principles, the fundamental truths that serve as the foundation of a belief system. Psalm 42 says the deep calls unto deep. The deep part of God calls unto the deepest part. Remember, the shallow part is the sea. It's my soul. It's the water. The deepest part is where the hidden path is. The deep part is where God is. It's the path that God made. That's the part. I must go beneath the shallow part, my shallow wisdom, my shallow understanding. Look at Romans 11.33 again. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his ways past finding out. Isn't it such a beautiful scripture of the depth the profundity that the word profundity that's what it means deep insight oh the deep insight the deep thought the deep knowledge listen no matter how much you find keep searching no matter how much you see keep looking no matter how much you discover keep digging paul says that the deep ways of god are unsearchable this literally translates, you ready? This literally translates the deep ways of God have never been searched out. That's what it translates. When Paul wrote that, he, he was saying, there are the things of God, the deep things of God, that man has no idea of, and because of that, he's never even begun to search for them. Isn't that an amazing thought? Look at Isaiah chapter 64. For since the beginning of the world, Men have not heard nor perceived by the ear. Neither has the eye seen, O God, besides the, what he has prepared for him that waits for him. I love this scripture. Remember this. Satan, who used to be God's light bearer, doesn't want you searching for wisdom. He doesn't want you to attain wisdom. It's your victory over the natural realm. Wisdom will give you the victory over the natural realm. And Satan does not want you to have that victory. And he'll do whatever it takes to stop you. When we think about things that the devil offers or that Satan offers, it always has to do with uh, sinful desires fulfilled in my flesh. We see all that is good as coming from God and all that is evil as coming from the devil. But remember this, the serpent offered Eve the tree of the awareness of good and evil. He offered her the tree that gave her the, the awareness, the ability to, be, uh, to perceive both good and evil. The devil will offer you good things to stop you from searching for deep things. <clears throat> Satan will offer you what appears to be blessings. And we will say, I am so blessed of God, not knowing that it's just something that will placate you so that you will not continue to search for the deep things of God. I could almost preach here. Remember when Jesus was being tempted in the wilderness by the devil. Look what Satan said in Luke chapter 4. And the devil, taking him up into a high mountain, showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give you in the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will, I give it. If thou therefore wilt worship me, all shall be thine. How many have ever scratched your head? when you read this scripture. All these years when I would read this, I just thought, what a ridiculous thing for Satan to try to tempt Jesus when, when he said, worship me. So we immediately conjure up this image of Jesus bowing down before the devil. How many have ever seen that? When, when you heard these words of Satan say, worship me, and in your mind you're thinking, Satan wants Jesus to bow down. Is that right? You thought that. That's just natural that you would think that. Bow down before the devil. It's such a vile image. 
that I always wondered this. How did the devil ever think that this was even a real temptation? How did the devil even consider that Jesus would bow down to him? And I've heard preachers preach that they didn't quite understand and they said, oh, Satan was giving Jesus a shortcut so that he could get, get around the cross and get back all that, that he had lost. But that's absolutely not it. They, my people still are destroyed for their lack of understanding. The word worship used here actually has to do, now get this, with yielding the vision to that which is good. That's what he was saying. If you will just yield your vision, if you will just give your attention to that which is good. This is what Satan said to Jesus. Look at all these worldly kingdoms. Look at all that's going on in the world right now. Look at all the pain. Look at all the abuse. Look at all the suffering. I will yield to you. This is what he said. I will yield to you all the authority over good and evil both to do whatever you will. This is what he said. To do whatever you will. The, actually, Satan was coming. The devil's coming. And he's appealing to the soul of Jesus. To Jesus' human side. He's literally offering Jesus the same deal that he offered Eve, thinking that it's going to work again. He offers Jesus exactly the same deal. Look at Genesis 3, starting at verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Yea, as God said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die. For God does know that in the day you eat thereof, your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Remember, we've gone over this before, but I'm going to say it again. Remember this. God made the woman from Adam's rib. Remember that? The Bible says God put Adam into a deep sleep and he took his rib. That's what the King James translated because that's what we always believed in Sunday school. We were taught that God took a rib and he created uh, Eve out of Adam's rib. But that's literally not why. I know there's so much that's happened through that. He made it out of his side so that she would be one with it. This is literally just... Christian propaganda that you've been given over the years. You've got to, you, how many want to see deeper? <clears throat> you got to quit looking at the water and you got to go what's underneath the water. You got to see the path of God. God made the woman, which was a type from Adam's rib, or in the Hebrew, it means Adam's side or one side of Adam. The woman was representative of the soulish side of Adam, the weaker side. How many understand that your soul is the weak side of you? He made her from the, from the rib, the side of Adam, the weak side. The soulish side of Adam was actually the vulnerable side of Adam. And the serpent told her, in the day you eat of the fruit of the tree, of the knowledge of good and evil, your eyes will be open and you will be as, and the word God is the word Elohim. You will be as Elohim. You will possess, this is literally what he said, <clears throat> you will possess the same ability as God to effect change. You will possess as Elohim the same ability to effect change. Let me ask you this question. You ready? This is a loaded question. How many of you have ever said or thought, if I was God, I would blank? If I was God, how many, truthfully, how many have ever said, if I was God, I would, and you fill in the blank with whatever you believe 
needs to be done. Amen? So we are already overthrowing God in our desire to, to change something that we don't think God is changing. You see the how quickly rebellion can come just by me looking through my human eyes through the compassion of my heart. If, <clears throat> if I was God, I would end world hunger. How many have ever thought that? Of course you have. If I had all the money in the world, I would end world hunger. How many have thought that? That would be as being as God. If I were God, I would end all suffering of children. I would end it. All human suffering, people that suffer. You watch those, those St. Jude commercials. How many weep when you watch the St. Jude commercials? And you think, if I was God, that precious little child, I would take care of that situation. If I was Elohim, I would end the abuse of the helpless. How many know that the list could go on and on? Right? I would get rid of corrupt governments in the world. I would do uh, make sure that people were treated fairly. I would take away all races. I would destroy uh, the ability for there to be racism in the, in the world. I would do all these things if I were God. If I were God. This is literally what the devil was offering. You will have the authority of God, of Elohim, in your own power to do as you see fit. You will become as God. You will have the ability to change the world into the utopia that your bleeding heart desires to see. Truthfully, if you were given the authority right now to end world suffering, wouldn't you do it? Wouldn't you do it? When you look at poor, especially for the elderly or children, wouldn't you do it? This is literally what the devil offered to Eve and to Jesus both. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also to her husband with her, and he did eat. It says here, and when the woman saw. The word saw is the Hebrew word ra'ah. It means to think about to meditate on, to view, and she began to imagine. How many in your mind you begin to imagine, if I could just end this, if I could stop this, if I could step in and change this, I would. She began to imagine, meditate on it. Here's what we need to understand. There is true life-changing power that flows from the tree of life. There is true life-changing power that flows from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Jesus functioned solely from the tree of life's power. Natural man functions solely from the power of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in all the good that they do. Natural man functions from the power of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Religion is the attempt to combine both. You understand that, right? Religion wants the tree of, the, of, of life. They want to be able to call it God, and yet they want to change it by their own power. The power that flows from the tree of life is the grace of God or the divine influence, which is supernatural. The power that flows from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is also grace, which also came from God for the natural realm, but its influence is nothing but natural. In the kingdom, there's a spectrum of order that runs from the superior to the inferior. Supernatural is superior to the natural. Look at Philippians 2, starting in verse 5. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of man. And being found in the fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God has highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that in the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven, and things in earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord of the glory of the Father. 
Jesus is the highest position in the highest place. This is what we need to understand. Jesus holds the highest position. All that is in heaven and on earth are ranked beneath him. The Father just stands separate. In fact, the Bible says that one day God, that Jesus will hand it all back over to God. Who All things will be all in all at that point. But right now, the Father has given it to Jesus. All power, he said in Matthew in the last chapter. All power, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. So Jesus is the highest position in the highest place. Rank is position of authority. The higher the rank, the greater the authority. So the greatest in the kingdom will be given the greatest authority, while the least in the kingdom will operate or function at the lowest rank and the lowest authority. Now, this isn't well known or understood in Christianity. Look at verse 8 again. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Jesus earned his kingdom position through that which he willingly suffered. Let me ask you this question. How many would love to have a kingdom promotion? How many would love to see your position in the kingdom elevated? How many want to walk in a greater degree of authority? How many of your desire has always been to walk in the authority of God? <clears throat> the self-preserving and the self-defending way will keep you locked in a low-ranking position of authority. When you walk self-preserving, self-serving, uh, self-defending way, when you walk in that, that attitude of pride will keep you locked in a low-ranking position of authority. Paul said these words, let this mind be in you. Let this mind, the word mind is to be continually directed by thought. Jesus' life was directed by a mind completely devoid of self-preservation or self-defense. Look what Jesus said in Matthew 23, verse 12. <clears throat> and whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. In the kingdom, in the kingdom, the humbled will walk in an increased authority. While the self-defending and self-preserving will be abased, or literally what that translates is, they will be stripped of their rank. They will lose their authority. Your greatest spiritual potential is always found in the lowest natural place. But if you fight to elevate your natural position... Your spiritual authority will diminish. It's like this. In the supernatural kingdom, Jesus is king. He owns the highest ranking position of authority. Everything in heaven and on earth is under or of lower authority than Jesus. Everything on, in heaven, everything on earth is of lower authority than Jesus Christ. In order for you to walk in a higher ranking authority, you must hold a position or rank that elevates you closer to Jesus. It's the same as it is in the military. It's exactly the same. The lower you are in rank, the less authority you walk in. The higher you are in rank, the more elevated you are in rank, the closer you are to the supreme commander. This is what he's talking about. When you walk in increased authority. How many have ever said, I want to be able to uh, say to the devil, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, just like a mountain. I want to be able to take care of the situation. Well, I can walk in and just lay my hand. The less authority you have, the less obedience in the supernatural realm is required. Satan will not bow where he doesn't see rank. 
In order to walk in a greater authority, you want sickness to go, you want, God's got to be able to trust you. How many understand that? God's got to be able to know that you hear his voice and that you're only operating from the tree of life and not the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That you're not just functioning so that you can take care of things the way that you see fit, but the way that God sees fit. See, God trusted Jesus, and because he trusted him, he gave him this great authority. Now, let me say this again. In order for you to walk in a higher ranking authority, you must hold a position or rank that elevates you closer to Jesus. Not emotionally, like Christians tend to believe, but positionally. Not emotionally. See, we try to get emotionally closer to Jesus. Has nothing to do with that. Literally nothing. You've got to understand the kingdom. This is a hidden path. If you want to be elevated in the kingdom, it's going to cost you. It has nothing to do with your emotional way. It has to do with positional way. <clears throat> you know, there must have been a multitude of worship songs over the past dozen years or more that have been written about knowing Jesus or being closer to him. We've sung many of them over the years. And you know what? They sound beautiful, don't they? They sound beautiful. And, and they're sincere. I want to be closer to you. And it's easy to weep and, and sing and worship and say, God, I just want to be closer to you. I just want, and this is this emotion, it's this soulish draw of somehow just being emotionally closer. They sound beautiful. They're emotionally moving. But they're nothing more than Christian propaganda. They will take you nowhere. That's why these worship movements never go in. They sound good. They stir my soul. They stimulate the depths of my, of my feelings and my emotions. But they will take you spiritually nowhere. They're just Christian propaganda. Look at Mark chapter 10, verse 35. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, come unto him, saying, Master, we would that thou shouldest do for us whatever we shall desire. How many of are like that with Jesus? We just want you to do what we want. <clears throat> and he said to them, What would you that I should do for you? And they said unto him, Grant us that we may sit, one on your right hand and the other on your left hand, in your glory. Isn't that amazing? Grant us, give us, do us this favor. Grant us that we may sit. Lord, this is exactly what James and John were saying. Lord, we want to be close to you. But Jesus said unto them, you don't know what you're asking. Can you drink of the cup that I drink of and be baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized with? These men desperately love Jesus. Their souls love Jesus. James and John connected with him. We all like to say that that's our spirit man, but they just had this strong, soulish friendship with Jesus. It was like brothers. And they just they were just saying, look, we just want to be close to you. Lord, we just, we just want to be. They were singing, hold me close to you. Never let me go. How many have ever sung that? I lay it all down again. To hear you say that I'm your friend. We desperately want to be close. We desperately want to be his friend. We want him to say he's our friend. How many in, in your mind you just think, oh, if Jesus would just consider me a close friend of his. I just want that. Lord, I'm going to sing to you. And with my beautiful song, I'll draw you to me. They were singing Knowing you, Jesus, knowing you, there is no greater thing. You're my all. You're the best. You're my joy and my righteousness. And you know what Jesus said? Maybe he was singing it. You don't have any idea what you're asking. You're just singing words. You have no idea what you're even asking. Jesus is saying that to us in this generation that we live in now, and I know this is truth. You're singing all these beautiful worship songs like you just want to be, you know, holding me and, and, and have our arms around each other like friends. It has nothing to do with that. You don't even know what you're asking. You don't have a clue what it costs to attain the rank that will elevate you close to me. 
see if Jesus is the general as I work my way up through the ranks. In rank, I get closer and closer to him. That's what it takes. It takes me working up through the levels. And every level comes with seasons of repentance, seasons of change in the way I see and think and believe. In Philippians 3, Paul said that knowing him comes with a great price tag attached. He called it the fellowship of his suffering. The fellowship of his suffering. How many understand that? The only way that ever increasing rank is obtained in the kingdom of God is through the fellowship of his suffering. Through the pride of my life continually. He says I must be humbled. I must be continually humbled. When the pride of my life, the pride of my heart is continually put down. When the, my self part is continually crushed and humbled and he sees me truly humbled in his sight that I'm doing this for no reason I have no pride I have no uh, I have no self-defense left no self-preservation just like Jesus and he sees that I'm beginning to function from the tree of life instead of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that I have no agenda that I don't have a, 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 com a, a God complex that where I want to change the world how many have ever heard Christians say, you know, if the Lord would give me a healing ministry, I would just go out and heal everyone. It's not God. That's your agenda. That's not the way God does it. His ways aren't like yours. His thoughts aren't like yours. They're not like mine. God has his own way. His way is in the sea. His paths are a mystery. And you must continually seek this God of wonders, this God of mystery. Seek me and you shall find me when you search for me with all your heart. Father, we worship you and we honor your name. We give you glory and thanks and praise. I pray for all the mothers today that you would just give them a wonderful day. God, I pray for the, the ones that are lonely and, and the ones that are, are not able to be around family, that are missing their family. God, I pray that you would be with them, that you would encourage them. Father, I pray that they would seek you, and even as David, that they would encourage themselves in the Lord. Father, we bless them in their homes where they are. We bless them in this time, Father. And we pray, God, that you would bring us all back together, that we might fellowship, that we might have the fellowship of the, of the brethren, Father, that we might love and, and see each other again face to face. And, Father, that you would heal hearts today, heal hearts today, that we would focus our minds and our eyes, that we would have the mind of Christ, that we would focus our eyes on you, that we might know you, the only true and living God, and might give you the glory and the honor and praise. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all.